All right, here we go. Tough topics, distractions, and little foxes. Distractions and little foxes. How many of you, talking about some church people, how many of you know where I'm going with this already with the little foxes thing? Yeah, we'll get there in a minute. So this is not one of those ones that I had uh, planned on speaking in the Tough Topic series. This is just another one of those that uh, God just kind of dropped in my mailbox and was like, hey, we're going to go there. Um, and I, I kind of struggled with this because I kept thinking, what makes this a tough topic? And it kind of dawned on me, here's the reason, because you're going to hear this message today, and here's going to be your tendency, and I'm just putting it out there. Your tendency is going to be to push back against it a little bit and to say, well, I don't really have a problem there. I don't really struggle with that. The, you're being, and, and, and I'm just, I'm going to say it first before any of you guys say it. You're going to say, you're being a little bit legalistic. Ooh, that's a, that's a bad word, right? Just bear with me and we'll get there. But does anyone else think that foxes are cool? I, I kind of think foxes are, are really unique. Let's, we got some fox pictures here. Let's, let's check those out. See, look at that. Isn't that great? Fox pictures. We have fo there we go. There's a, okay, that's a cool fox going through the snow. Here, how about another one? Oh, look at that. Isn't that cute? Oh, look at, look how handsome he is. Yeah, look at that. Now, now this guy right here, you didn't know they had like fox glamour shots, did you? <laughs> like this guy is totally set up. He's like, I'm ready. Go ahead. Like that. Okay. And then this last one. This one's real. Have you ever seen this before? This is really cool. And this kind of really goes more towards the message. Like, foxes are really good hunters. And, and a fox will be able to detect something underneath the snow. And they will jump up and literally dive head first into the snow to catch their prey. That's pretty cool. Anyway, so, all right, that's enough of that. But I just thought it'd be fun. Um, so, speaking of foxes, there's this true story. Um, a fox, a wolf, and a weasel all go, go to a restaurant. And the, the, it's a true story. And, and the server comes up to the table and says, what can I get you to drink? And the fox says, water. And um, it says, um, coffee, growls the wolf. Pop, goes the weasel. been waiting all week for that one. Thank you very much. I got another one if you can take it. All right. Did you know that a fox can jump higher than a house? Now, this is partly due to their very, very strong hind legs and their real good jumpers. It's also partly due to the fact that houses can't jump. All right, that's it. I'm, I'm done. They can close for prayer now, and it would be a good day. All right. Have you ever heard the expression, sly as a fox, or cunning as a fox? It's, it's kind of cute. My nine-year-old, Isla, uh, you guys remember Ethan Swinehart. Um, he has a nickname for her. It's Fox or Sly Fox, just because she, she loves to play little tricks and stuff on him. So sly as a fox. Foxes are known for their cunning abilities. Foxes for, for thousands of years have been thought to just be these creatures that just have this intuition that is, is beyond many other animals. Um, in fact, have you heard, you've heard of Aesop's fables, right? In Aesop's fables, there's this one called the fox and the crow. And the crow had found a piece of cheese or some kind of bread or something and the fox goes up and he starts talking to the crow and, and started to have this conversation. And the crow is holding this food in its mouth and the fox wants the food. And so the fox starts kind of flattering this crow. And the fox says, you know, I bet you have a beautiful singing voice. You're, you're a bird. You, you probably have this. And he said, yeah, I kind of do. I have a beautiful. Well, well let's, let's hear you sing. And the crow starts to sing and what happens? 
He drops the cheese and the fox gets it. Did you know that Aesop, from Aesop's fables, was, uh, he lived in the time from 620 to 564 BC. That was during the time of Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Bet you didn't know that, huh? That's pretty interesting. So for thousands of years, foxes have been known to be these kind of sly creatures, these, these animals that you have to be really careful with because they'll slide right in and you won't even notice, and by the time that you do notice, it's too late. Well, in the book of uh, Song of Solomon, Solomon and um, it's a really, really interesting book. We're not really going to go too deep into it, but if you read the book of Song of Solomon and, and you really read it as it is supposed to be read, it would make any person blush, okay? It is like pretty deep, and, and what it is is it's kind of this love letter back and forth between Solomon and what is thought to be uh, his wife or one of his wives, who many people think was the daughter of the Pharaoh of Egypt. And so they're kind of, as you read through it, they're kind of having this conversation, a very, very romantic, intimate conversation with each other. Again, it will make you blush. Um, but in, in the middle of their seemingly inappropriate conversation, this one verse comes out, and you're like, where did that come from? Like, like what, what does that even mean? So um, in Song of Solomon chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 14, and we're just going to read two verses. So the first verse says this, and I'm going to read it as it was written, so don't criticize me too badly, but... So they're, they're talking back and forth to each other. So it says, my dove in the clefts of the rock. Now, we have no clue what that means. Like, guys, if you tell your wife that she looks like a dove in the clefts of the rock, she's probably going to smack you, so don't do that. Make up something that sounds a little better. But to them, like, this was like, this was steamy, okay? All right, my dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places on the mountainside, show me your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet, and your face is lovely. Nice, huh? I mean, they really know how to put it on. And then there's verse 15, and it's like, where did that come from? It says this, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards are vineyards that are in bloom what? Like, like, as you're reading it, you're like, that's not exactly the thing that I would put in the middle of the love letter. So what does that mean? Obviously, it's there. It must mean something. Well, there's a little bit of debate among scholars of, of what it means. And here's what I've always heard. And as I did more research on it this week, this is, again, I kept coming upon this. It may be a little different, but this makes good sense. And it, it really paints a picture of what happens with these little foxes. So back then, obviously, vineyards were prevalent. Okay, we don't really grow grapes here, but they, they had vineyards all over the place. And you would have a fox, a, a large adult fox, and they would sneak into the vineyard. Remember, they were very, very crafty. They would get into the vineyard, and the big foxes, the adult foxes, would be tall enough to reach up and grab and eat a cluster of grapes. Okay, so that's bad, right? If, if you are uh, a farmer and you're growing grapes and you go out in the morning and you see like half of your crop like this, I don't, are they a flock of foxes? I don't know what in the world a bunch of foxes are called. But if you had plural foxes come out and start eating grapes and you had all of these clusters of half-eaten ruined grapes, that would be bad, right? Okay, cool. Um, but then there's something else that would happen that was even more destructive than one fox or a few foxes coming in and eating just a cluster of grapes. You would have little foxes. You would have these very small juvenile foxes that weren't tall enough to either reach up with their head or get up on their hind legs and eat a cluster of grapes. 
but they would see the adult foxes eating these grapes, and, and, and they would know that they were good. They would know that they would want them, but they couldn't get them. So what would they do? The little foxes would come in, and they would chew at the roots of this vine. And they would gnaw on it, maybe trying to pull it down, maybe just frustrated they couldn't get it. Maybe that was their only thing that they could get. And, and they would eat at the roots and at the bottom of the vine. Now, if you've ever grown a vine, what happens when you clip the bottom of a vine? The whole rest of the vine dies. Now, we'll ask it again. A missing cluster of grapes, bad, right? But the entire vine dying, really bad. And that was because of a small fox. A little fox that you probably didn't think was that damaging. This little fox snuck in there and ruined this whole vine. So as, as I was kind of processing this, as, as I was having a conversation with somebody about this, I was thinking, it's really easy to see the big foxes in our lives, isn't it? Those, those big kind of blatant sins that we talk about a lot. And we've got a, a list of things and just a handful of them. But it's a lot more challenging to look in our lives and to see what the little foxes are. What these things that, mm, you're being a little bit legalistic there. Um, I can handle that. That's not really a big deal. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look and try to see if we can find any little foxes that are in our lives or that are in our midst that we need to get rid of. So first off, let's look at some examples of big or adult foxes. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 verse 12. It says, therefore, that's our big word, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. And then verse 14, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. So I think it's pretty clear there that we are supposed to watch out for sin, that we are supposed to watch out for these big things that are in our lives. It's like, don't live in sin anymore. You don't have to do that. You've been saved. God has made a way, like, like get rid of that old life. Be transformed by renewing your mind, as we talked about last week. Get rid of that. Don't live in that. So, again, I'm talking to a bunch of church people. That's obvious, right? It's obvious that we have to watch out for these big foxes in our lives. So, here's just a list that I've come up with, just some kind of common big foxes that we see. None of us do these things, but we, we see other people do them. Um, you have greed that affects every area of your life. You've got lying, deceit, and dishonesty that manifests itself in all areas. You've got alcoholism or substance abuse, adultery, having idols or little g gods in our lives, promiscuity or any sexual relations outside of marriage, obsession or involvement with the occult or quote-unquote dark lifestyles, we'll talk about that here in a minute. Addiction to pornography, murder, and last but not least, rejection of God or at least full obedience to his commands. Now, those are just a small handful of big foxes that most of us would agree, yeah, those are bad things. We don't want to do those things. But again, here's the problem. What we fail to realize sometimes is what leads us into those things. Like, nobody just wakes up and decides that they want to 
do this massive sin one day. I mean, I guess some people do, but that's not usually how it works. So let's look at some examples of little foxes, but we're going to compare them to big foxes. But before we get there, just flip open to Ephesians chapter 5. I know we're bouncing around a little bit. This is such a good passage. I have preached on this passage before. Uh, If you remember, I I did a a message about guardrails, having guardrails in our lives. And if you think about guardrails, I always think about Whale Harbor Bridge. Because I grew up down here, I I grew up there, there used to be an old bridge and we would spend the night on the old bridge shrimping and all that. So I, I love thinking about Whale Harbor Bridge. And on the side of each bridge is what? Guardrails. Now, those guardrails keep you from plummeting into the water, right? Because plummeting into the water would be a bad thing. Are we all in agreement that plummeting into the water, bad? Okay, cool. So, but what we can do if we're not paying attention, we can bump up against that guardrail. Now, it's going to do a little bit of damage to our car, right? It's going to scrape it a little bit, but if we just kiss the guardrail a little bit, it's not that bad. I mean, eh, my car, but like we didn't plummet into the water, right? So that guardrail is there to keep us from doing something, but there is still something to say about bumping into that guardrail. So as it applies to this passage, and we're going to see, and again, I've, I've preached this message before. I don't need to go too deep into it, but those guardrails are not necessarily sin. They're not necessarily these commands, don't do these, but guardrails are things that we need to put in our lives that are like, okay, right on the other side of this guardrail is instant death, right? Right on the other side, like we're going off of the cliff if I go through this guardrail. So we need to set up guardrails in our lives to stay towards the middle of the road, to stay in our lane, to not even bump up against the guardrail. We're not necessarily going to die, but it's still going to do some damage if we're hitting those guardrails. So that's what this passage is talking about. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. It says, have, what's that word? Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Now, here's our three key verses right here. Verse 15, be, how careful? Very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. And then he puts something so strange in there. He says, because the days are evil. You know, a good way to think about that, what that means is, guess what? There's plenty of hardship and temptation and and all of that junk out there that's just going to hit you anyway. Don't help that. Like, be very wise in how you live, because the days are evil. Therefore, he just backs up and says it again, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, we're going to stop there. Paul gives us an example, you can read it later in that passage of a guardrail, of how to be very, very careful in living your life. He's not calling it a sin necessarily. He's saying, be wise, be very, very careful in how you live. So here we go. Here's some examples of little foxes. So what what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of our big foxes and we're going to see what one possibility of a little fox is that matches up to our big fox. So our first big fox was greed that affects area, every area of your life. Now we would say, we could find verses that say, greed is bad, don't be greedy, be generous. Why? Because God was generous with us, therefore we need to be generous with others. So greed that affects area of your, every area of your life, big fox. 
So what would a little fox be? What would something that kind of creeps under the radar, kind of timely for now, huh? Something that creeps under the radar and we don't recognize it right away. And I think that might be one example at least, extreme obsession with frugality and money. I know people like this. I know people that, and and I I want people to be frugal. I I want you to be cautious. I want you to be wise with your money. Absolutely, there is tons and tons and tons of passages in scripture about that. But there is a point to where you can be so extreme in this that it turns into greed. Be careful. Watch out for little foxes. Here's our next one. Lying, deceit, and dishonesty that manifests itself in all areas. The little fox, parents, we see our kids do this, right? Withholding the full truth. Mm. You ever had one of your kids come in and tell you what happened, and then later on you find out that was about this much of what happened, right? Yeah. Yeah. When we get into a pattern of not being fully honest. We're not really being dishonest. We're just not being fully honest. Can we call that a sin? I don't know. That's not the point. It's a little fox that creeps into our lives that leads us to a big fox. Next one, alcoholism or substance abuse. Obviously, we can find scripture that that this is wrong, right? So what's the little fox to that? It's being comfortable with your relationship with alcohol and other quote-unquote medications. We have to be very, very careful with this, especially as followers of Christ, not only for our own selves, but for the fact that we are not to be stumbling blocks to other believers. And and if you really want to know, I guess I'll go ahead and say it. That Ephesians 5 passage, the example, the guardrail that Paul talks about is alcohol. You can read it later. We won't get into it. Oh, you're being legalistic. I'm, I'm not saying that drinking is a sin. That's not the point. I'm saying we, especially as followers of Christ, have to be very, very careful in this area. The next one, adultery. Adultery. How about just flirting with a coworker or someone who is not your spouse. I mean, I would say that's probably in the wrong category, but many people would look at that. I'm just being friendly. I'm just, you know, I'm kind of the charmer in the office. It's okay. That's just what I do. No, it's not what we ought to do. We ought to respect our spouse in a way that we don't do that. Um, everybody heard of Dave Ramsey? You know, the financial guru, um, he's awesome. I listen to a lot of Dave Ramsey stuff. Um, he has this really cool thing that he says. He says, 100% of foreclosures happen on a house with a mortgage. <laughs> right? I mean, this is big stuff, right? I think the same is true. 100% of adultery probably starts at a flirt, doesn't it? Ooh, got quiet in here. So we've got to be careful about those little foxes that we're letting in. How about having idols or little g-gods in our lives? That's definitely up there as far as what God is looking, saying, don't do that. Focus on me. I want to be your God. So how about being addicted to your phone or social media? This could be one of many, many, many little foxes. But that's a gateway into having idols into our lives. Promiscuity or any sexual relations out of marriage. Here's a big one. And here's one, again, not a sin. And we're so numb to it. It's being, becoming numb to media or a society that encourages a promiscuous lifestyle. Just about every, I won't say every, but just about every TV show, song, everything out there is encouraging promiscuity, is encouraging just all you need is love. 
like, like it doesn't matter, like it's in our faces all the time and every single one of us have become numb to it. We've got to be very, very careful as to what we are allowing ourselves. Oh, you're being legalistic. No, I'm being very cautious, as that verse said. How about obsession or involvement with the occult or quote unquote dark lifestyles? I've seen this. I've seen this being in student ministry um, for a lot of years. And here is the little fox watching or reading things like horror films or books that glorify satanic practices or ungodly lifestyles. I remember one particular student, um, and we watched this person. They were extremely involved in our student ministry, and I would watch the books that they would read. They were a huge reader. And we would just throw a little bit of caution there. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you should be reading. No, it's okay. It's okay. And we watched that influence, and I'm, I'm sure there were other things as well, but we watched that influence turn this person, greatly affect this person. I don't know exactly where that person is in their faith life today, but I watched this happen, and when we are just filling our lives and filling our minds and numbing ourselves with what, oh, it's okay, I can handle it, or oh, everybody's doing it, or oh, whatever, we're allowing little foxes to come into our lives. Nikki and I made a commitment. I'm proud to say this. Nikki and I made a commitment many, many years ago that we would not watch R-rated movies. We just don't, except for Passion of the Christ. I don't think that one counts. But we just don't watch R-rated movies because we don't think we can handle it, because we've never heard those words before. Because, nope. Because we don't want to invite that into our lives and into our home. It's just a commitment that we made. Is it a sin to watch? Maybe, maybe it's PG and not PG-13. I don't know where that line is. You've got to decide that. How about an addiction to pornography? Obviously a sin, right? I think the little fox would be enjoying the first look so much that you take a second look. Be careful. Murder? Got a verse for that one. Little Fox's acceptance of hatred or strong negative feelings towards someone. Realize I said acceptance. When you accept that you hate someone, that you just, oh, you can't stand that person so much. What did Jesus say? That's just like murder. Hatred is just like murder. And the last one, rejection of God or at least full obedience to his commands I think the little fox or one of them is casual Christianity that looks more like fire insurance than a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Ouch, huh? I saved the best for last. Beware the little foxes that come in and they ruin the whole vine. They will wreck your entire life because you let this little thing creep in and creep in and creep in and you get numb to it and then you don't think it's a problem and then you justify it and then one day everything comes crashing down that's how it works so the big fox group is undeniably sinful against god's will against god's plan and again the small fox group the little foxes they may not be sin, it's debatable, they're gray areas, right? And they're based on your own convictions. And this is really big because I'm not here to be your Holy Spirit today. So if you're starting to think you're getting a little on the legalistic side, I'm not here to be your Holy Spirit but guess what? You're not your Holy Spirit either. The Holy Spirit is your Holy Spirit. That's a conversation that you have to have with him to figure out, hey, God, how much is too much for me? Or what are some areas in my life that mm, I've allowed some little foxes 
to creep in. That's a conversation that you've got to have with God. Now, here's why this is massively important. This is our, our target statement for today. This is like, if you write anything down, this is it. Unnoticed, small distractions lead to undeniable, severe destruction. Unnoticed, small distractions in our lives, things that we don't notice, things that uh, it's not that big of a deal, it's not really a sin, I can handle it, that's not too much, everybody else is doing it. Unnoticed, small distractions lead to undeniable, severe destruction in our lives. That's how it works. You don't get a pass. You're not exempt from it. That's just how life works. So we've got to be very wise and very cautious about how we live. No one wakes up in the morning and says, you know what? I think I want to be a crack addict today, right? Nobody wakes up and says, today's the day that I am going to give up everything in my life and become homeless, just totally give up. Nobody says, you know what? I'm going to go commit a crime today that, uh, you know, I could just go spend the rest of my life in jail. Nobody just wakes up and decides to do those things. They happen because you make small compromises over time. And you, what you maybe once saw as something that's not okay, oh, well, that's not that bad, okay. And then, well, there's the line, and then you get up to the line. Well, that's not so bad, and you see how you just keep pushing that guardrail over and over and over, and then the next thing you know, the guardrail is over the edge of the cliff, and you're in imminent danger at any moment. Unnoticed, small distractions lead to undeniable, severe destruction. Anybody ever seen a sinkhole in real life? I've never seen a sinkhole in real life. I think they're kind of fascinating. Uh, go ahead and put that first picture of a sinkhole up there. Look at that. That's, I mean, imagine that. You're, you're driving down the road, and the next thing you know, your car goes into a massive hole in the ground that just appeared. Now, that's I mean, look at those kids. They're sitting there looking at the car. They're like, dude, look at the car. If it were me, I'd be like, dude, I wonder if I could bunny hop over this hole. That would be me, Okay. Never claim to be a smart guy. Okay. But imagine that. Imagine you're just driving along and all of a sudden, this hole opens up in the ground and you drive into it. Go ahead to the next picture. That's a whole house. Look how big that sinkhole is. And sinkholes happen because everything looks perfectly fine on the surface. But guess what? There's some stuff happening under the surface. There's some water moving around, and it's pushing stuff out of the way. And until one day, it can't hold it any longer. And everything comes crashing down. That's how little foxes work in our lives. So real quick, I want to give you four points, four ways to minimize distractions. You can write these down real fast. Four ways that we can minimize, and I put minimize in there on purpose because, like, there's going to always be distractions. There's going to always be these little foxes that are trying to creep into your life, but we've got to recognize them. So how do we do that? How do we recognize them? Here's four ways. Number one, real simple, this stuff isn't brain surgery, guard your heart. Guard your heart. I love this verse, Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else, and I've said this a thousand times, King Solomon, wisest man to ever live, says, above all else, the most important thing I can tell you is what he's saying, wisest guy ever, above all else, guard your heart. Everything you do, every bit of life, everything that happens in life flows, comes out from your heart. Guard your heart above everything else. Number one, guard your heart. Number two, catch the foxes. Just like our verse said, 
catch the foxes. So here's a question that we all have to ask ourselves. What are some little foxes in my life that I need to take care of? And remember, they're not necessarily sins because we know, we know we're, we, we've got to get rid of the sins. But what are some little foxes or what are some guardrails that you need to set up in your life that maybe aren't sin, that maybe is kind of in a gray area, maybe that you can handle, but maybe you just want to be even more cautious than you already were because sinkhole, crash and burn, nobody wants to end up there. Number one, guard your heart. Number two, catch the foxes. Number three, rely on accountability. I say this all the time. This is so important to have people in your life that are not afraid to speak up and say, hey, man, I just got to say, I, I, I've been seeing this in your life. Like, the, the attitude that you've had recently, it's just, I, I don't know, man. It, it, it seems like there's something wrong. Or the words that are coming out of your mouth. Or, like, just, it, it, we need people in our lives that have the guts to call us out in love and in grace, but to help us walk through. We need accountability in our lives. Galatians 6, 1 and 2, it says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. I love that. Carry each other's burdens. Have accountability in your life. You can want to change all you want to. Like, like I, I want it so bad, and I, I, I just don't have the motivation, or I just, you can want it really bad, but until you have somebody that's calling you out in the right way, so helpful, so helpful. I, I was listening to a uh, um, a video yesterday, and it was by this guy, Magnus. He's, he speaks on fitness and nutrition, and he said this, motivation is overrated. Like, as much as you want to do it or you think you need motivation, motivation is overrated. Discipline and accountability are what matters. So true, so true. So number one, guard your heart. Number two, catch the foxes. Number three, rely on accountability. And number four, build a firm foundation. Build a firm foundation. I love these two verses, Matthew 7, 24 and 25. I've got them written in the concrete downstairs of my house. And it says this, therefore, now this is Jesus. That's our big word, right? This is Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, Jesus has said some stuff in the Sermon on the Mount, right? He has totally flipped the script. He has totally thought, you guys thought you knew what the law meant? You're completely off, let me tell you. And, and in like three chapters, he gives it to them. And they're standing there like, what? And he says this, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Compare that with the sinkholes. Foundation was not on a rock, was it? It was on some stuff that had some problems underneath. Crash and burn. Really wanted that to be a little more dramatic. It wasn't. Anyway. Number one, guard your heart. Number two, catch the foxes. Number three, rely on accountability. Number four, build a firm foundation. Unnoticed, small distractions lead to undeniable, severe destruction. I want to close with this. Back in, uh, speaking of older Christian songs, back in 2007, Casting Crowns had a song called Slow Fade. I see you guys, like, there's, there's a handful of you guys. You're, you're tracking with me here. And, and, and the song was perfect. It's about, listen, things don't just always happen immediately. It's this slow fade. Little foxes that creep in, and we think that it's okay. We think we can handle it. Well, it's not sin. I should be able to do it. Well, this makes me happy, and Jesus just wants me to be happy. And we throw all of those stupid excuses out there. And next thing you know, it's crash and burn. 
I just want to read through the words of this song and then we'll close. Verse 1 says, be careful, little eyes, what you see. It's the second glance that ties your hands as darkness pulls the strings. Be careful, little feet, where you go. For it's the little feet behind you that are sure to follow. Verse 2 says, be careful, little ears, what you hear. When flattery leads to compromise, the end is always near. Be careful, little lips, what you say. For empty words and promises lead broken hearts astray. And the chorus says this, it's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray. And thoughts invade, choices made, a price will be paid when you give yourself away. People never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. And the bridge says this, the journey from your mind to your hands is shorter than your thinking. Be careful if you think you stand. You just might be sinking. Let's pray. God, thank you for warnings. Thank you, God, that you tell us to be very careful about how we live. That, God, that you challenge us not to live life right up against that guardrail, right next to imminent death, but, God, that you warn us to just even stay away from that. Don't even go close to the guardrail. But what's truly amazing and beautiful, God, is in the middle of the road, in the middle of the lane is where you want us to be, and that is a perfect life, this life that you have designed for us, God, that is so much better than those temptations. This life that you have set up that is full of joy and peace, comfort, all of those things that we long for, God, you are desiring to pour those out on us. So God, help us not to try to find those things in whatever else, whatever little foxes that there are. God, help us to find all of that in you because that's what you promise. Thank you, God, that you love us enough not just to give us this example, but to give us the example of Jesus Christ. And God, you loved us so much that you sent your son, your one and only son, the most precious thing down to this earth. Not just to live as a great example, but to die in our place. Thank you for the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Shedding his blood on a cross and washing away our sins. Thank you for the free gift that you offer to us. But we know that's not an automatic thing, God. That's a commitment to you. Say, God, your son Jesus gave his life for me. I give my life to you. God, I pray for those this morning who have never said that, who have never committed their lives to you would right now be the moment right now in this moment God if people do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior would they just say God I need you thank you for your son Jesus right now I accept the free gift of salvation God I give you my life you said that this morning for the first time heads are still bowed eyes are closed I'd love to know I'm not going to call you out but would you just slip your hand up so I can just celebrate and pray for you anybody say that for the first time today today's the day that I got my relationship right with Jesus God thank you so much that you are real that you're not some made up God to make us feel better 
you are the real thing. God, help us to recognize the little foxes in our lives and help us to get rid of them. Catch those foxes, get rid of them. Help us to be more like your son, Jesus. God, I pray for this time of offering. God, help us to be generous as you were generous. Thank you for your love and your grace. And it is in your amazing, amazing name, the name of Jesus. Amen.